This meeting is being recorded. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, we're just waiting for colleagues to join into the room, so we'll give it another minute or so before we start officially. But welcome and thank you so much for joining us and happy World Oceans Week to all of you. It's great to see the room filling up. We'll just wait another minute to see if the numbers stabilize and then we'll, we'll get going. Okay. Once again, good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're based. Thank you so much for joining us. I see that the number of participants is growing. So we'll just wait another little bit before we start so that we make sure all interested colleagues are able to join us today for this really important conversation that we're hoping uh, to get maybe more traction and attention among the ocean practitioners community and continue throughout the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture in 2022. Okay, well, I think may maybe we seem to be ready to start. The number seems to have um, stabilized. So my name is Elisa Morgera. I'm the director of the One Ocean Hub, uh, and I'm welcoming you today to this webinar, also on behalf of Nicole Franz at the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, as the Hub and the UN Food and Agriculture Organization has been partnering on advancing the understanding of the human rights of small-scale fishers and we're delighted that on the occasion of 2022, the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture, many other partners um, from the UN level to the national, regional and local level have come together to try and work even more closely, um, both to showcase and give the right recognition to the contribution that small scale fishers make to global food security, nutrition, poverty alleviation and overall uh, fishery sustainability, but also really shining a light and, and develop deeper understanding of all the barriers and injustices that small scale fishers face so that we can all be clearer about our respective responsibilities um, and opportunities to contribute to the full respect and full realization of the human rights of small scale fishers. We're also very grateful that the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights has is partnering more closely with FAO and the Hub and many other partners in raising awareness also within the uh, human rights community around the specific challenges that are arising in the fisheries sector. Um, and they, we have their sincere apologies for not joining us today as this is a bank holiday uh, at the UN in Geneva, but we are working very closely with them uh, in the follow-up to this event. Um, and just to say that while uh, we have a multiple, I think, points of view that we will expand on and learn from today, uh, we're really keen on understanding how not only what are the range of challenges in ensuring the protection, effective protection and full realization of the human rights of small scale fishers, but also really reflect on the opportunities that that deep engagement with the human rights based approach can provide for supporting the achievement of multiple sustainable development goals in the context of the fisheries sector and really showing the benefits for governments, for business and for many other actors in um, fully engaging and being committed to the human rights based approach. And hopefully the International Year um, for Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture is really an opportunity to expand and strengthen partnerships across scales for all of us to play um, a better and more meaningful part in the protection uh, of the interdependent human rights of small scale fishers. And identifying good practices and sharing those good practices with others to, to engage in that. Um, FAO and the Hub have done quite a lot of work already in the past few years to really try and advance and understand all the opportunities of implementing the FAO voluntary guidelines for securing sustainable small-scale fisheries 
in the context of food and poverty alleviation um, in supporting the application of the human rights-based approach. Uh, we've done so by learning and engaging with researchers, small-scale fisheries representatives and governments, particularly in Ghana, Namibia and South Africa, thanks to a regional workshop we co-developed um, and also work on a legal and policy diagnostic tool, which we have recently published and really captures some of the learning um, that our researchers, small scale fishers, partners and others have been able to uh, distill um, so far. Uh, but we're really looking forward to build on that, expand the partnerships and really through the conversation today, bringing it forward at the UN Ocean Conference at the end of the month and many other international events throughout the year we can bring together as much as possible the environmental and sustainable fisheries community, the human rights community, and any other partner that can contribute to the full protection and realization of the human rights of small scale fishers. And so today we are very privileged to be able to hear directly from small scale fishers, um, as well as researchers and partners and organizations that work very closely with them about their understanding of the challenges and the opportunities that we're facing. And then we're very equally uh, privileged to have the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment with us, Professor David Boyd, and colleagues from the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, who will reflect on the role of different mandates across the UN system to support uh, actors at different levels um, in the engagement with the human rights-based approach. And hopefully this is just a conversation that we're starting and FAO, the High Commissioner and the Hub, as well as I'm sure all of you on the call um, will contribute to further that conversation and find even more synergies and potentially untapped opportunities um, in other UN bodies and, and office holders. So without further ado, I'll, um, I'll lead into the first part of our event, which is a round table, which we will hear and learn from small scale fishers representatives and organizations that work closely with them. And the idea is really to develop um, uh, for all of us a full understanding of what is a holistic, a coherent approach to the protection of human rights uh, of small scale fishers with a view to then think through the benefits that we are maybe missing uh, in terms of um, achieving multiple benefits and supporting multiple sustainable development goals. Um, then we'll have um, an opening to, uh, to all the colleagues on the call to share their experiences, insights, challenges and questions, um, and an opportunity there for the special rapporteur and colleagues from FAO to reflect on the role of the UN to support the work that all of you are doing. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll introduce the colleagues that are sitting on the, our virtual round table. Uh, they have been given the opportunity to respond to three questions, and some of them will respond to all of them. Uh, some of them maybe will focus on one. But the three questions we'd like to uh, focus at first are, first, what are the main challenges in protecting the human rights of small-scale fishers, the barriers, the injustices that have been faced? Secondly, have procedural rights related to participation, access to justice and access to information, uh, whether procedural rights have been effective in protecting small scale fishers livelihoods, their culture and their environment. And finally, also whether there's been some experiences where the protection of substantive rights of small scale fishers related to food, culture and a healthy environment, including a safe climate have already provided for that concrete experience of um, supporting the achievement of multiple sustainable development goals. So I'll give the floor first to two colleagues um, from South Africa, uh, from the in, um, uh, Small scale, scale Fishers Cooperative in the Eastern Cape, uh, Melissa Pullen and Sylvia Hartley, who are respectively the chairperson and deputy chairperson of the Small Scale Fishers Cooperative. Thank you so much, Melissa and Sylvia, for being with us. Uh, we're really looking forward to hearing from you about challenges um, and experiences you can share with us today. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I would like to, I've already introduced myself, but for those who joined uh, afterwards, um, I'm Melissa Pullen. And this is Sylvia Hartley. Um, I'm the chair lady for, for Mugha Sakofa Saraya Cooperative in the Eastern Cape, South Africa. 
Um, I would also just want to know from you, Lisa, could I give a bit of background? Yes, of course. Or should yes, I just start on the questions that you've... If you can give a bit of background, that would be really helpful. Yes, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, so, me and Taryn have spoken earlier, and um, she's asked me to get some info from, from my mother, who's also a fisher, fisher lady. Um, so, we've grown up uh, at the ocean. Like uh, my grandmother, she used to work in the oysters. And now my mother is working in the oysters and now she's teaching us to work in the oysters. So that is like a traditional thing for us that's been going for years. Um, and on your questions there that you've asked, the first one was on the challenges. So the challenge that we have is, uh, I would say for lack of info, lack of information from the department side. And also the other challenge that we have is we don't have any uh, legal support. And um, on the second question for procedure, procedural rights, um, I would say our rights have been violated. Mm -hmm. The reason why I'm saying that is because we have not been consulted in any of the decisions that the department has made regarding the, the grant of the fishing rights to the small scale fishers. And um, also the other thing, they didn't take the necessary steps mm -hmm. uh, when they introduced us to the fishing rights. For example, the, the um, permit conditions was one of the, I feel that it was one of the main things that they were supposed to put out for us before even, before we even got our permits. So yeah, in the, in the last one for the co-benefits, um, I would say, for us, it's a it's a cultural thing. It's we are tied up with fish in our culture and our livelihoods, and also our we we protect our environment where we're fishing it. We are the ones protecting it. So that's why I've also said that they should have consulted us, and they gave us rights that there's things that we need. That, they, that we needed them to include us in like the oysters, for example. And then there's another issue of the seaweed. These ladies, they've been, it's also a cultural thing for them. So for them to not include seaweed in their basket was, uh, was disrespectful from their side, I would say. Yeah, and we keep our ocean sustainable. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Melissa. I think that came across loud and clear. And also that not only the interconnections between culture and livelihoods and protection of the yeah. environment, but also through that, how you see the interconnections in the environment and how oyster yeah. and seaweed and other aspects need to be managed in a more integrated way, including the understanding of the cultural significance um, for small yeah. scale fisher, which is a huge contribution as governments do struggle with that. Um, and they could really benefit from your insights. So thank you so much for that. And hopefully there'll be chances to expand on this, but really appreciate it. Okay, thank you, Lisa. I'll now pass on the floor to John Thomas Spartagus, who's the member of the World Forum of Fishers People and also member of the International Planning Committee for Food Sovereignty uh, Working Group on Fisheries. John Thomas, you have the floor. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for giving this opportunity to discuss uh, uh, the rights uh, to discuss about the uh, discuss about the human rights from a small scale fisher perspective. Uh, thank you all for giving this opportunity. First of all, I have to uh, say uh, I have to start with saying that there is uh, seventy percentage of the world is covered by oceans, but we are as the ocean people, we are the politically marginalized people in each nations. So I take this example 
uh, I, I mean, not an example. I have been experiencing this in the Asia, uh, Africa, and the developing uh, small developing third world countries as well as from the small island nations. So after the post uh, after uh, what you say after the post World War uh, Two. Uh, and the uh, establishments of UN and other, other the human rights, uh, the human rights declaration itself. If you see the histories, there is also the side by narration of transforming fisheries industries in large in these third world countries, especially Africa, Asia, and also in the other other small island nations. This transforming uh, narrowed down the ocean people's customary rights. We as the ocean people, we have, uh, we are not rolling with the fisheries economy. We, we are having a separate way of life. And uh, we are like amphibians. We have rights over the land and the rights over the sea. And we have the rights over still the sea has been connected. So we have this amphibian rights. What, uh, uh, what examples or what narration as Melsia has said, it's largely about our customary rights. But the procedural laws and others still they, there is no recognition of customary rights of us. We have been praying for this, resisting for this, demanding for this. But we have been negotiated, finally we have negotiated with uh, a small VGS of guidelines, which also says to recognize us, we recognize our customary rights, recognize us in all the participation, uh, participation, represent us in all the levels of governance. But still date, no state has been recognized us. No nation state has been come with that. This plays the ma major challenge of human rights. This is how this is where the politically marginalized capture fishers, basically the ocean people, are, are being marginalized. After Rio 20 plus, they all talk about the Rio 20 plus, the, the future we want. The future for the ocean people, the future we want is that come uh, uh, assert our ocean, assert our ocean rights. It's not alone uh, assert our Hambipian rights, the rights over the land and the sea. Why the states are not providing us our customary rights? Why the ocean civilization? We are the way for many, many oceans. Our ocean economics has been, ocean economics has way back to many nations our, because of the gateways of many nations. But we are not being, we, our rights has been eroded. We are being dispossessed from our rights. Each and every attitude of our rights has been dispossessed. No nation state has been coming back to say has, this is customary rights. Rather they're talking about tenure rights. Tenure rights is not traditional. Tenure rights is not historical. We are asking for our customary rights. We are asking for a customary law. We are asking for involuntary guidelines, uh, binded nations to provide our customary rights. So that is the way that is the greatest challenge. That is the greatest challenge that is going on. This historical injustice, subjugation of our rights is going still the ages of our lives. With this fisheries as an industry, which is corporatized and which has been challenging us, which has been uh, uh, which has been, uh, what do you say, <laughs> which has been uh, er erasing, erasing our economy, uh, way of life. Fishing is only a part of our way of life. Ocean is our identity. We are the ocean and we are the people. But today's ocean conference or many other conferences, the ocean people, <laughs> they doesn't participate. There is no participation of ocean people. They call us fisher people. Why we eat fish? <laughs> Why we, 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 that, that's not. Fish can be given by everybody. Today's aquaculture, the boost of aquaculture, fisheries can be given by a non-fisher who's not traditional in nature as fishes. There are now fisheries as a food right to food means anybody can cultivate fish and give. The entire ecological civilization of the entire globe has been only recognizing the culture-based cultivation civilization people, not the other ecological basis. We are the downtrodden lava. We are the untouchables. It is like that. So this is the right way that we are asserting our rights. We claim our rights. That's what I said when Rio 20 said that, Rio 20, uh, 20 plus said that the future we want. The, the next two years, blue economy has come as saying that the new frontier of development is blue economy, which started eroding us, which started grabbing our oceans. So, so I here to say that, which is human rights, how this, these are the main challenges. The other two questions can be easily been seen from this lens. What our future is that? Our future is that asserting our ocean, asserting our customer air rights, give us the ocean sovereignty, give us the ocean governance, and then let us, uh, let, that is the only way to stop 
to keep a full stop for this subjugation of rights. Indigenous people have kept the full stop through their CDRIP, uh, UN Declaration of Indigenous People. But still, the other ecological based community, community, which is the larger capture fishers people, both in the inland and the ocean, who are being declined with their rights. So we the ocean, we are the people. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Well, thank you so much. And I think you raised a few additional points that are really important for researchers, organizations. I think you also of UN mandates in terms of supporting recognition of customary laws and customary rights, which includes engaging with history of marine dispossession, which uh, in our understanding is lagging a bit behind compared maybe of understanding of land dispossession uh, and legacy of colonialism and other um, dynamics that have uh, really negatively impacted on that recognition today as a precondition for then re um, realizing participatory rights and effectively then, as you say, having control and being part of those processes of hopefully sustainable blue economies, but potentially ocean grabbing. So I really very much appreciate these contributions and I'm sure we will explore them in more depth as we keep going. And I will now pass the floor to Sebastian Matthew, the executive director of the International Collective in support of fish workers. Um, Sebastian, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Elisa, for giving us the floor. Uh, I think uh, at the outset, uh, I would like to uh, draw our attention to the collective experience of dealing with COVID-19, for example. I mean, it was a time when uh, many of the human rights were uh, kind of taken away or truncated. So I think, uh, and the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, protocol, uh, the, the negative impact of this protocol was uh, very uh, severely felt by the small scale fishing communities because that took away their access to resources uh, in some cases that uh, majorly took away their access to uh, markets in, in many other cases. So therefore access to resources and access to markets very much linked to SDG 14B uh, were denied uh, due to COVID-19. And so that really uh, raises uh, the issue of human rights and uh, the importance of human rights. Uh, and, uh, and here we have to uh, bear in mind the fact that uh, the small scale uh, fishing communities, uh, both marine and inland, uh, you know, they often uh, lack uh, private property. They are uh, in a common property regime. Uh, they don't have even the places where they live are often uh, collectively uh, community owned or you know, on the public land of uh, uh, the government. So therefore they are actually uh, in a tremendous need of uh, protection of their human rights uh, by the mainstream community, uh, by the mainstream citizens of, of each country. So therefore, uh, why uh, fishing communities need greater uh, attention to protect their human rights arises from the fact that they are operating uh, without any private property in a common property resource base. So therefore they are at the mercy of the nature and the mercy of uh, many other sectors. So that is uh, the backdrop uh, to our um, uh, kind of intervention. So firstly, when we uh, talk about challenges, I think uh, the first point that comes to my mind is uh, the uh, uh, what Jones also mentioned, this denial of uh, customary rights. Uh, we recently had a, a workshop uh, in Bangkok early May, and this was an issue which, which was highlighted by several participants from South and Southeast Asian countries. So denial of customary rights is very important. Uh, denial of informal uh, community rights are very import important. Uh, denial of traditional rights are very important. So, I mean, one, one can debate whether to use tenure rights or not. Uh, to me, tenure rights would be inclusive of customary rights. So I would say that uh, tenure rights uh, can include customary rights, informal rights, traditional rights to marine and inland fishing, of uh, marine and inland fishing communities, to resources, to spaces where they live, this uh, adjacency principle of land and water, I think all that has to be recognized within that. So th I think this is one important challenge. How do we get these, uh, these rights recognized? Uh, only the formal law uh, plays a role in most cases. Even if uh, these rights exist, these are more like a de facto, but not de jure rights. And then I think uh, 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 along with this issue, what really complicates uh, the uh, reality, the experience at the national level, local level is that uh, uh, there, there is a, a plurality of agencies dealing with uh, various aspects of the guidelines of the small scale fisheries 
In fact, uh, the way uh, the, the guidelines that uh, Elisa referred to earlier, uh, small scale fisheries guidelines for uh, promoting food security and to uh, prevent uh, uh, and to uh, lead to poverty eradication, these guidelines, uh, they uh, almost sort of spell out uh, various dimensions of, uh, of, uh, of human rights. But you can see that uh, you know, the fisheries department are often very much uh, hesitant uh, to uh, talk about human rights because they feel that they're a technical agency, they should be only talking about technical issues. So therefore, it's very important that uh, the, when you talk about human rights, uh, various uh, you know, procedural rights and uh, substantive rights, I think we need to make sure that uh, these are the agencies in, in, uh, responsible for these rights are uh, playing a role. And, uh, and in this context, I think uh, I, I'm thinking of the national human rights institutions, which have to uh, play a much active role in bringing this coordination across different industries, departments, and the uh, different stakeholders. So I think that, again, it, it's, a, it's a very important area where the United Nations can play a very important role. And uh, uh, the universal periodic review reports uh, that are filed by each country at the UN uh, can be very effective. In fact, I was going through some of the recent reports. Uh, the Thailand report 2021, in fact, talks about how they have implemented work in fishing convention and how they have uh, uh, registered some uh, nearly 2,000 to 3,000 cases of violation of uh, human rights of uh, workers on board fishing vessels. So therefore, I think uh, this universal periodic review definitely can be used uh, and the human rights institutions can and play a very active role. And then uh, uh, this can also lead to uh, maybe greater legal uh, recognition of uh, collective human rights, because often human rights um, seem more at the individual level. When you talk about fishing in a common property resource, uh, in light of uh, climate change impacts, uh, we would uh, prefer that uh, you know, collective human rights become a very important consideration for policymakers. So therefore, I think more work needs to be done to, to raise the profile of collective human rights. And that, that again, the, we would really appreciate the, the offices of, uh, of the UN uh, Special Rapporteur to pay attention to these issues. And then uh, last question, can you talk about the, the procedural rights? I think, uh, you know, if you talk about marine protected areas which are being created, uh, there is a talk of 30 by 30 uh, uh, marine protected areas. Uh, then again, I think it highlights the importance of uh, effective uh, consultation and participation of fishing communities. In fact, this is one uh, common human right which you see in the Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries. You see it in the, uh, the uh, small-scale fisheries guidelines and in several other instruments. So therefore, I think the consultation and participation should be really elevated to their uh, position in, in all this kind of uh, issues uh, related to uh, uh, declaration of marine protected areas. Uh, when you talk about allocation of a uh, total allowable catch between different gear groups to make sure that it's equitable. Then we talk about the migrant workers, you know, how do you take, take care of the, their interests. Then uh, marine spatial planning, the, there are sometimes talk about different uh, uses of the coastal and uh, marine space. And how do you talk about, uh, in, in that context, uh, the importance of uh, procedural rights, consultation, participation with effective communities coastal zone management, and, uh, and then uh, in context of reclamation of the marine spaces, sometimes uh, uh, people are losing access to their fishing ground from traditional points, or when they are being displaced, I think all these areas need a very, very strong uh, attention paid to, uh, to consultation and participation. So these are the kind of uh, uh, points uh, I just wanted to highlight. And again, I would like to uh, uh, this NHRA, not National Human Rights Institutions, uh, definitely should be playing a role so that we get a much greater balance between uh, procedural rights and the substantive rights and between uh, different agencies dealing with the various aspects of uh, life and livelihood of uh, small scale fishers and fishing communities and their you know, cultural rights. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Sebastian. I think you raised so many important points that connect with what was said earlier, but also the, I think the magnifying lens of COVID-19 and how it showed even more and unfortunately even deepened more some of the injustices you mentioned. But I also like that point about how multiple public authorities may think about their mandate in technical terms and through that maybe stay away from engaging with the human rights based approach and this is maybe something that we really need to to challenge and think how we can support more and more public authorities who may not feel or understand that their role is also contributing to the human rights based approach to to play their part 
Uh, and your report on natural, nat national human rights institution is well taken and actually leads very nicely to our next um, panelist, Sile Sidzen from the Danish from the Institute for Human Rights. For human so, Sile, rights. you have the floor. Thank you very much, Elisa, and, and thank you also from our side for organizing this uh, hugely interesting event. It really is a pleasure to, uh, to have this conversation with so many people with important things to say. Um, thanks for showing the slides. Yes. So at the Danish Institute for Human Rights, we are a national human rights institution, so a sister institution of national human rights institutions in other countries. Uh, we also have something special, namely an international mandate to support uh, human rights institutions abroad. So that is why we we are operating in, in an international uh, level also, apart from, uh, from our contributions to human rights in Denmark. Um, so our work on, on human rights in oceans really takes place in, in the international space uh, and in these kinds of dialogues, uh, plus some national level interventions. Um, we set out a few years back to look at uh, human rights and, and oceans governance, oceans management, and to look at the extent to which uh, the human rights dimension was recognized or not. Uh, so we looked at the recommendations coming out of the human rights system. So recommendations coming from the treaty bodies that oversee the implementation of, of international binding conventions, the recommendations coming out from the Universal Periodic Review, uh, recommendations coming out from special procedures um, to see how much um, engagement there was in the issues faced by, by officials. Uh, and what we found was that not very many recommendations uh, actually spoke about the situation of officials. We did find some. We find, found 70 recommendations out of more than 200,000 <laughs> recommendations in total. So it's a small percentage. Um, but still the themes that come out are, are quite clear and they are themes that resonate with other speakers have already talked about. So we found recommendations on equality and non-discrimination, uh, often in relation to uh, government's um, allocation of fishing quotas. Uh, so fishing quotas are oftentimes not going to the marginalized and poor groups of fishers, but rather to the more commercial actors. Uh, we saw a lot of recommendations on the right to an adequate standard of living. Um, some examples are Senegal and Djibouti, uh, dealing with uh, the deprivation of local fisher communities' means of subsistence. Uh, we saw a few recommendations on the right to a healthy environment, namely from Nigeria and Madagascar. Um, and again, of course, about uh, marine resources and, and uh, environmental pollution, climate change affecting uh, fishing dependent communities access to, to those marine resources that they depended on. We saw a few recommendations on the rights of indigenous peoples given to Norway, Mexico and South Africa. Um, again, on, on uh, violations of indigenous peoples rights to access their traditional fishing grounds uh, and, and maintain their traditional lifestyle. Um, we saw a few recommendations on special measures on the need to uh, provide or take special measures to secure uh, fishing dependent marginalized communities access to marine resources and markets. Um, and given the fact that we, we talk about the right to a healthy environment later, uh, I thought that one recommendation was interesting to highlight, one that we saw from 2019 from the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Uh, uh, recommendation to Senegal that says um, that the committee is concerned about the fact that small scale fishers are deprived of their means of subsistence as a result of overfishing, mainly by foreign companies. Um, it moves on to then talk about the, the need to secure participation of fishers uh, when fishing agreements are negotiated, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So that speaks very clearly to some of the issues that Sebastian just, just raised and, and, and other speakers here. Um, can you move to the next slide, please, uh, Senia? So, so a, a, yeah, a brief snapshot of, of what we see coming out from human rights mechanisms. Of course, as human rights actors, we think it is not enough. We think we could do better. Uh, we know, and uh, we have heard here from 
everybody on this panel that, that there are human rights issues at stake in the fisheries sector. Uh, we believe that we can use the international human rights mechanism better than we are currently doing. Um, and some of the, the strategies there would be to do capacity building for institutions working on human rights and also institutions mandated to oversee the fisheries sector in line with the, again, what Sebastian just said. Uh, we find that national human rights institutions have uh, a mandate that is applicable, obviously, to this situation. Not all national human rights institutions see so or are aware of um, human rights at sea. Uh, so there's something to do there in relation to taking up that dialogue, and that's something we can all do. Um, reaching out, communicating, having dialogue. Uh, we also believe that what we're doing right now is uh, hugely important, having this kind of dialogue, um, documenting the issues, sharing reports, etc. Um, I show you on the left hand here one of our small reports on, uh, on small scale fisheries and human rights issues and, and, and how to push for more accountability. The third thing I wanted to mention was um, using the complaints mandate that the uh, human rights mechanism have. So filing complaints when we see human rights violations uh, in the fisheries sector, both in the international system, but also of course with national human rights institutions where they have a complaints handling mandate. Uh, last slide please, Senior. We will stop after this one. Um, this is to show recommendations that came out from the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues in, in the session last April, so very recently, um, as a positive example of an international mechanism uh, taking action, showing attention to the situation of, of fishers. Uh, the first recommendation said that the FAO is to prepare a study on the impacts of industrial fishing on the rights of Indigenous peoples in regard to traditional fishing. Sorry, there's a misquote there. And the second one, FAO and ILO to conduct a dedicated study on human rights violations suffered by indigenous peoples in the fishing sector. So two reports to come out from the FAO and to be presented to the forum uh, in 2024. Um, again, uh, we think this is a good example of, uh, of an international body taking action because issues were raised in, that, uh, in the context of, of uh, the discussions during the forum. So Aboriginal fishers from uh, Australia uh, came with a statement from the floor where they talked about uh, the need to uh, secure their continued access to their maintaining their cultural fixing, fishing practices. Uh, and they also called for uh, a stop to prosecution of uh, indigenous peoples practicing their, their traditional um, fishing practices. And they requested the government to embed the principles of the UN Declaration in, in the approach to management of fisheries. So um, this and a side event that we conducted in cooperation with FAO and Indigenous Peoples Major Group on Sustainable Development and the International Work Group for Indigenous Affairs, where we also discussed these issues uh, and had uh, Indigenous speakers from, from Russia, from Finnish, SAPMI, uh, etc., and from South Africa. We have uh, South Africans today too, so I should not forget that. Um, so we believe that the fact that we have these dialogues, that we, we come with the documentation, can help uh, move things forward. So um, with this, uh, I want to stop here. Thank you so much, Sil. I think a lot of good points and, and a really good... Uh... Uh, general, I think, point about we all can help. And so with that, I'll pass the floor to three colleagues from the One Ocean Hub who are researchers uh, working with small scale fishers and really asking ourselves what is our role and how we can contribute on the protection of, of human rights and small scale fishers. Uh, so first I'll give the floor to my colleague Bola Rinosho from the University of Cape Coast in Ghana. Bo uh, Bola, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Alisa. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're uh, watching and listening to us from. Um, and thank you all for attending. Uh, I have been listening to all the interventions, and I must say that they mirror some of the uh, 
output some of the things we have found out from our research, uh, particularly. So I work, um, I research on the hub focused on Ghana and small scale fishers in Ghana. And listening to Melissa and Sylvia, for example, a, if we had a small scale feature from Ghana on this panel, I suspect that they will say almost quite similar things to what they have said. And interestingly, later on this week, uh, where we have a short film coming out uh, uh, following the impacts um, fishing on a small scale fisher woman from Ghana and in that film she does talk about some of the issues uh, Melissa and Sylvia have talked about so thank you for setting the scene and of course um, all the other panelists as well. Um, now to the my short intervention I think what we have found out from the research in Ghana is one of the main challenges for us uh, is that there is not yet a clear articulation of the connection between human rights and the challenges of small scale fishers. So often the discussion around uh, small scale fishers, uh, yes, they, they might think about it in economic terms because uh, fishing is you know, a, a foreign exchange contributor. So often there is a lot of discussion around it and its impact on the economy or perhaps trade matters and sometimes around the environment. But what we haven't seen yet clearly is that recognition that the challenges of small scale fishers, whether it's declining fish stocks, whether it's this possession of their uh, traditional spaces are not just in, does not just impact on their human rights, but there are also human rights problems. And so that's one of the things we're, we're not yet seeing come true. And it's great that we've got the Danish Institute on Human Rights talk uh, on the presentation, our representative from that, because uh, one of the things we found out is that even with our human rights uh, at, at, you know, administrative body, uh, they haven't yet thought about human rights issues quite clearly, specifically for the ocean. So yes, they, you know, they do indices for human rights generally, and yes, some of those communities are ocean communities, but a uh, uh, concise or consistent focus around small scale fishers is one thing they haven't yet clearly articulated. And so that's one of the things the hub is seeking to do to, you know, you know, clearly um, push that uh, that uh, recognition of the importance of human rights. That you know, these challenges, small scale fisher challenges, are human rights challenges. And in order to do that, uh, in order to resolve those matters, you've got to think about it from a human rights perspective. Now, of course, that has advantages for us because if we're able to clearly articulate these challenges as human rights problems, then it creates opportunities for us to be able to demand from duty bearers accountability. So governments will then be forced to, you know, uh, take measures to protect those rights. And because many of those rights are constitutional rights, it opens up opportunities for judicial interventions and administrative remedies, which would normally not be open if this were only cast as, say, um, uh, economic matters. And so it creates opportunities if we're able to do that. And that's one of the reasons why we're actively pushing the idea of human rights. Uh, challenges of small scale features from a context of human rights. And of course, closely associated with that is if the small scale fishing communities are able to, they have the empowerment and that's where capacity building comes in as uh, you have quite rightly mentioned. If they're strengthened to be able to demand those rights through all of the various mechanisms available to them, then we have a situation where those rights will be protected. And so that's perhaps I think one of the big challenges. Now to the question of procedural issues. I think procedural rights are very important uh, to protecting small scale features. And I focus particularly on the right to participate in decision making, which is very important. Now it's uh, perhaps well established environmental right. Uh, and, you know, uh, the environmental impact assessment regulations, for example, in Ghana, talk about it. But one of the challenges we've identified with that is 
there is no clear definition of what we mean by right to participation and the corresponding duty to consult. Often what happens, and as I said, which is one thing we would, if we had uh, a small scale fishing from Ghana, that's what they would say. The idea that uh, those consultation processes can be elitist. And so they would often exclude those communities and peoples who actually need to be involved in participation. And so it, it can be very tokenistic where, you know, uh, yes, we uh, advertise and say we're consulting and we take a few, you know, top leaders to uh, the capital and that is, you know, that suffices as consultation. And, you know, and so the, the extent of consultation and the extent of our right, I think, is something which we need to clearly put across and for states and governments to understand, you know, the very parameters of the duty to consult and the right to participate in decision making. Now, uh, on the fourth, third point, I think what I want to highlight the most is, yes, yes, there are important uh, co-benefits. Uh, uh, from uh, all the multiple sustainable development goals. Now, uh, I look at the right to culture, for example. Uh, one of the things where, which is being proposed in Ghana at the moment, and we are in the process of uh, uh, implementing that, is the idea of co-management of the fisheries. Now, for the first time, it's formally recognizing that uh, traditional authorities and the people they represent play an important part in preserving those resources. And so it clearly talks about the fact that the customs and the traditions and the taboos and customary law in particular of those communities are, have been potentially very beneficial in preserving the resources over the years. Uh, and as has been mentioned, and Elisa quite clearly summarized it, you know, there has been um, a lot of problems because of uh, historical dispossession, uh, you know, uh, disruptions due to colonialism, etc. But still those communities are there and they've got their customary law, which often is quite well established. But for a very long time, uh, governments uh, really focused on centralized administration of resources, excluding those customary laws. Now the idea is to try to integrate that and we're trying to see how we can help facilitate these communities to see how that kind of integration works. And I think one of the great things uh, which we can learn from the communities is around the development of customary law. One of the great features, often the critiques of customary law is, for example, we talk about how it's unwritten and how, um, you know, it's not codified, so it's difficult to know what it is and all of that. But those things which we consider flaws are actually also strengths. You know, it means that it is flexible. And even if it's unwritten and it's lasted this long, it means that it's resilient. And one of the things about customary law in Ghana is that it often develops through consensus building. And so it that idea of consensus building, which we already have within these communities is something which perhaps needs to be uh, included in this our right to participation, which we're talking about. And so it's learning from what we already have. That's, I think, one of the ways to go. And of course, if we're able to uh, do that, then we're, go we're up potentially uh, achieving our desire for the respect for cultures. And of course, if we respect those cultures, then there is uh, added benefit to uh, the marine resources. So the if we're able to do that in a very holistic and inclusive manner, then the fish stocks will, of course, uh, recover. And that in turn also helps the communities. And that also then helps uh, you know, that helps us secure our right to food, which is also an important one because, you know, if the stocks are stable, then the right to food is secure, the rights, livelihoods of these communities are also secure. And so I'd leave it there. And thank you for to everyone for all the various interventions. Well, thank you so much, Bola. And I'm, I'm becoming mindful of time, but I think there was such richness. I think also in your reflections on, on customary laws so are really important complements to what has already been said, as well as I think the critical point that the challenges 
may be quite similar in different countries. And so with that, I'll now pass the floor to Tapiwa Warikwanda from the University of Namibia. Uh, please try and keep to five minutes if you can, uh, although I know these insights are so, are so important. Uh, Tapiwa, are you ready to take the floor? Yes, Prof. I'll try to make it as snappy as possible. Uh, let me quickly get into the challenges that uh, we've been encountering from this uh, angle or from this perspective. Firstly, the fact that, uh, as you're aware, we had uh, no standard definition of uh, small scale fishes uh, within the context of uh, Namibia. And what that does is it leads to the second challenge, which is the fact that the socioeconomic value that uh, the small scale fisheries have is underestimated. In other words, we have what we call the diseconomies of scale. Um, you know, the small scale fisher communities cannot add value uh, to the quantities or the, the catch that they have in the sector. And you also have an additional uh, element that emanates also from the lack of a standard definition uh, is the fact that, uh, you know, information and data uh, on small scale fisher communities is minimal. And of course, what this does is that uh, what uh, possible contributions could emanate from the sector are rendered invisible and uh, they are not necessarily able to enable um, this particular group of people to contribute uh, from a policy perspective. And they cannot be also recognized for purposes of supported plans or national programs um, or interventions that may um, you know, need to be implemented. However, at this point, I must ask them to mention that um, since the start of uh, 2020 engagements on uh, you know, the small scale fisheries, uh, a national plan of action is coming through and that may change uh, so this particular challenge in terms of um, you know, uh, the access to information data and the socioeconomic uh, significance of uh, the SSF in Namibia. Uh, we also have uh, you know, a challenge in terms of exclusion from effective public participation. Though the constitution in many ways, that is, for example, Article 45, 63, or 74, they all talk about uh, the significance of uh, laws that have to be passed, which are inclusive of all Namibians or which are sensitive to the interests of all Namibians. We have noticed more often than not, like Bola mentioned, that uh, in the SSF, the engagements are largely elitist and uh, they tend to uh, ignore marginalized grouping of people. So here we have the Topnia amongst other people. And we also have the Hanganeni, though it's recognized in essence, but the benefits that it accrues from, uh, you know, the process of engagements around, uh, you know, fishery stakes is so uh, somewhat minimal and debatable. And of course, in terms of um, you know indigenous people's rights, there is definitely a certain marginalization, and this comes from many ways. That is, the language of the constitution is not expressly direct to this particular grouping of people, and neither do we have specific legislation that expressly deals with this particular group of people. And as a result, most of this recognition emanates from international instruments and. Uh, this is one area, obviously, that needs to be looked into going forward. And then, of course, the lack of access to financing. I think this is a very crucial uh, element. If um, this group of people have to uh, you know, become effective in any context for sustainable purposes or otherwise, or at least reach uh, the objectives of SDG 14B, then at least this element of uh, access to financing uh, must be dealt with. And of course, it's coupled to the aspect of lack of uh, information and data. Then of course, restricted market access is also another uh, crucial component. You need to think about this obviously from the fact that uh, the principal legislation that deals with uh, you know, the uh, fishery sector like the Marine Resources Act does not have any express uh, reference to the SSF. And uh, that of course, uh, it, it leads to this particular uh, challenge that we have. And of course, there may be challenge of ensuring quality of the fishing products as well is another challenge. Let me just uh, quickly jump to the procedural rights. Um, I could have mentioned more, but uh, let me just quickly jump to the procedural rights. Uh, like I mentioned that, um, yes, we have um, articles 45, 63, and 74, which all make it mandatory for the National Assembly to uh, adopt policies or legislation that uh, is reflective of all Namibians. But like I mentioned, when we look at uh, 
issues around marine spatial planning, stakeholder engagement, this grouping of people, the SSF are largely excluded. And of course, uh, there is need to look into this particular component. Then we have uh, quite a litany of other issues that are strictly uh, a list in terms of uh, rights to uh, work and free choice, whereas we have um, Section 3 of the Namibian Labor Act and uh, Section Article 93 of the Namibian Constitution, which talk about uh, prohibition of forced labor. We have challenges that emanate in terms of uh, you know, lack of access to substantive employment and gains and retains uh, from the process. So there is not necessarily a much uh, benefit that is accruing in, in this particular uh, context. And then of course, the right to adequate standard of living is adversely impacted in this particular context because of uh, lack of ensuring ethics and fair business practices uh, in a sector which is largely dominated by uh, uh, commercial um, fishermen. And then of course, you may want to look at that in the context of Article 95 of the Namibian constitution, which uh, talks about promoting and maintaining the wealthy of the people um, in this particular context. And that cuts across uh, empowerment of women, um, health and strength to workers, uh, issues around um, you know, the age of employment for children, et cetera. But all these things you tend to find them being infringed upon in, in the SSF sector to the extent to which those uh, people are, are involved. Of course, then there is need to enact deliberate legislation that specifically deals with uh, you know, equality of opportunities for women, we don't have that uh, as yet. Of course, there may be general reference to that, but no specific reference in terms of the language of the law. And of course, right to a health environment, uh, again, that's another component that one has to look at uh, with the key role being placed on the office of the ombudsman to make sure that um, there's no overutilization of living natural resources or there's no uh, irrational exploitation of non-renewable resources or degradation amongst other things. Uh, but again, this may largely apply to the commercial fishery sector, but also extends to the SSF. Of uh, course, with the rational arguments being made about uh, the extent to which the SSF has to play a participatory role in this particular context because they have not yet also uh, benefited from, uh, you know, the natural resources. Then, of course, there is the aspect of political rights and fundamental freedoms, um, where one has to look at, uh, you know, the current developments around the national uh, uh, plan of action for securing sustainable small-scale fisheries. And the hope is that the issues that we've mentioned is challenges like extensive participation and engagement and express definition will be dealt with in this regard. And once they are dealt with in this particular context, then we'll have a lot of uh, you know, inclusive or active participation of these small scale fish uh, communities um, amongst other things. And of course, they will also see a difference or improvement in terms of customary practices uh, when it relates to ownership or allocation of uh, sharing of marine resources. So I think in a nutshell, I want to put it there and just to add to the fact that um, there is need to stress emphasis on civil and political rights, aspects of the rule of law, good governance and democratic decision-making to make sure that the SSF end up benefiting. That was the marathon, Prof. Um, it was uh, a marathon, Tapiwa. Thank yeah. you so much. You, you ran very fast, that marathon, too. But thank okay. you. And I think that the final point, I think, on, uh, on how respect of civil and political rights leads to core benefits for small-scale fishers in the first instance. And I think the aspect of fair and equitable sharing of benefits from sustainable fisheries and other environmental protection um, with small scale fishers is, is crucial and came across really well. And of course, raises a lot of questions uh, from a human rights perspective. So I'll, I'll complete the, the round table, just giving the floor also to our colleague Tarin, also from the One Ocean Hub in South Africa, who I think will complement also what um, Elisa said earlier on. So we'll go full circle. Thank you, Tarin. Thank you so much, Elisa. Um, I'll be brief. Uh, I said in the in the chat that um, there's a sort of recent um, examples from South Africa that are good news stories in terms of the recognition of the procedural rights of small scale fishers. Um, in which um, there has been a real um, 
yeah, sort of ongoing series of applications to do seismic surveys for oil and gas exploration um, around the coastline of South Africa. Now, this has been going on for, for decades, actually, but a sort of threshold has been reached whereby um, there was a particular case on the wild coast, um, which, is, which is close to where I live, where um, fishing communities and their support organizations became aware, um, very out of the blue, that there was about to be a seismic survey commencing. And it, it, it was, this, the story has been very well documented by our colleague, Jackie Sunday, who's on the call, who's, who's written a, a, an article about this. But um, the courts have really listened to the um, small scale fishers and their lawyers who have um, been actively sort of expanding what meaningful consultation means. So the, you know, Shell's lawyers and the lawyers for, for the other um, oil and gas companies were arguing that what they did in terms of consultation was legally required. But through the, um, the, the affidavits um, prepared by the small scale fishers, um, the, 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 the true violation of people's um, sort of customary rights, um, particularly the absolute lack of um, sensitivity or consideration of people's language, of people's uh, remoteness and therefore lack of access to, you know, the three newspapers that something was advertised in, the vagueness of the advertising of a consultation process, the lack of following of any of the local cultural and customary norms for consultation, um, and the lack of um, care around- Wait, Thank you so much. The spiritual value um, of the ocean for, for my community. visa card. Sorry, David, we can we can hear uh, you. you yeah. <laughs> um, and so that yeah, they've really been showing how companies and consultants do the bare minimum in terms of consultation and how our standards and norms for consultation really need to be elevated. Um, and the judgments in those cases have really supported what is being brought um, by fishers and fishing communities um, in terms of really um, the need to be included. And there was a really, um, a really powerful moment where um, uh, one of the judges, it was just happening last week in the court in Kabecha, one of the judges was trying to ask, okay, so the spiritual value of the ocean and the fact that there is belief that ancestors are living in the ocean, how can we define that? At what point is the, at what point, where can we zone for development? You know, and, and the lawyer was saying, these are not things that I as a lawyer can be discussing in a court of law like this. The point is that this is a case about inclusivity. And the point is that the, the companies who are pushing to do this exploration and the state need to be having this conversation with communities for whom this is a reality. It's not for us to try and define here in this way. Um, so really um, important work in expanding what we understand as the sort of standards for consultation. At the same time, we are trying to explore the human rights dimensions of what happens when small scale fishers are granted rights to fish when they're then invited and encouraged by the state to enter into private partnerships to help them to realize their rights um, so that they can actually now, after so many years of exclusion, earn a decent livelihood carrying out their traditional fishing practices. But um, they are then very, very vulnerable to exploitation by companies who want to enter into partnerships with them to now um, generate income out of the permits granted to small scale fishers. And when small scale fishers are not given sufficient information, su sufficient support, sufficient advice, as they enter into these negotiations with private companies around the actual implementation of their rights because small scale fisher cooperatives do not have access to finance to boats, to to all of the, the, the 
um, resources and capital that are needed to turn um, the right they've been granted into the livelihood they have been promised. Um, that, that vulnerability to exploitation that can trap them into long-term, um, very exploitative business deals, we feel that that is a violation of their right. Um, that, and, and fishers have expressed this as being, if they're given a right, but they're not given any support in negotiating um, what they need to do to realize that right, they say it's like they've been given a lamp, but no paraffin, or they've been given a bowl full of food, but no spoon with which to eat that food. And we really feel that this is actually um, constitutes a, a violation of their right, even if they're given a right with one hand, with the other hand, it's sort of taken away. Um, and this is a very frustrating and um, yeah, de demoralizing situation that many small scale fishers who are now recognized through South Africa's progressive small scale fishers policy are sort of stuck in this catch 22 now. Thanks, Elisa. I'll stop there. Oh, it looks like Elisa. Thank you, Tarin. Yes, Elisa just dropped off. Um, I'll give the floor. She's trying to, to connect again. Um, I give the floor to WWF, Marina, that has some uh, comments and some questions for the panelists. Marina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so in our previous uh, discussions, um, I, we were uh, asked uh, to give a little bit of a background of the Accelerating Costa Community-led initiative of WWF. And uh, just to talk about uh, what uh, the, uh, you know, what, from what, what practical example to address uh, some of those challenges uh, can happen in, uh, in different regions. So Elisa, just to check, is it fine if I give a little bit of um, some practical example? Yeah, because the, what I can share is a little bit of a focus on how uh, different organizations, organiz non-governmental organizations, um, governmental organizations, but also the academia and uh, fishery representatives can join together in a, in a regional effort and working with uh, uh, FAO um, agencies to address some of those issues. So, and I'm uh, actually bringing the example of Mediterranean countries where I would say that many of the uh, challenges and the difficulties that have been raised uh, from so many different countries today are happening at the different level also in uh, the Mediterranean. So the Mediterranean, we, we, we should be considered that the 80% of the fishing fleets are small scale fishers. And uh, the Mediterranean is a, is a region where we have countries like European countries, perhaps rich and, and other uh, type of countries from, uh, from Africa or uh, the, uh, the Middle East. So a variety of culture, economic co uh, context, but the fact that all these small scale fisheries are sharing is the fact that the overfishing is becoming uh, a threat that is uh, putting in a serious risk, not only the economy of those and the, uh, and the livelihood of those people, but really the future of the sector, especially in a context where uh, the re the, basically the, the Mediterranean is overcrowded and uh, the small scale fishers has not really a voice within the planning at sea and uh, not even in the European uh, context where the, um, the so-called stakeholder engagement for marine special planning, it is something that it is within uh, the, uh, the directive, but it is not happening in the field and is not happening in the real uh, context. Why? Because the voice of the small scale fishers is not uh, really present and 
there is there are not the enabling conditions to have uh, those uh, fisher heard. So in this, this is the context where a number of uh, organizations have joined together effort to create a platform, an informal, informal platform called the Friends uh, of SSF of the Mediterranean, where WWF is co-coordinator together with the General Fishery Commission for the Mediterranean and uh, the Black Sea under uh, the FAO. So, which is the regional uh, RFMO for the Mediterranean. And together with uh, many other organizations, uh, we uh, join forces to support uh, the sectors in increase the, uh, the, the knowledge, especially to support on capacity building. Again, this is something that we heard also during this discussion today, the fact that some of the rights, some of the lesson learned or practical tools uh, are not known by uh, the different fishers in the, in the field. So from, from one practical exam example that um, the Friends of, F of SSF have been, uh, have been done, and actually during the COVID pandemic, when it was also very difficult to, uh, to engage and to meet, uh, the, um, the platform launched the SSF Forum, which is uh, a, a sort of a virtual and physical uh, capacity building platform for fishers and also for fisher organizations. And over the last, uh, the last years, 243 SSF fishers and stakeholders from two 26 countries have been trained on different uh, on different topics. The, let's say the core of uh, the um, uh, the the core of the the topic is all about shared governance or co-management, in uh, with the objective of creating an operationalized co-management. So not only creating the legal um, opportunity for the countries to put in place a shared governance of the uh, of the uh, area to be managed by the small scale fishers together with the, uh, the fishery administrations and scientists or NGOs, but also to create uh, a real opportunity to put that in place for a practical point of view from a sustainable financing point of view from uh, alternative livelihood point of view, but also with the objective of first looking at the needs in the ground that of course are completely different from country to country, from context to context, so that the officials can become the steward of the areas, the uh, sea waters and the, uh, and the sea resources and uh, create the uh, best uh, uh, management um, uh, solutions to uh, protect uh, both the ecosystem and the fish stocks. And everything it is framed within the uh, regional plan of action of SSF, of the General Fishery Commission uh, of uh, of the Mediterranean under FAO. And this is a, a, a real and uh, let's say, uh, um, a, a, an action plan agreed by all the different countries of the Mediterranean to uh, strengthen the policies and the, um, and, the, and the tools and the financial resources for small scale fishers in the Mediterranean. I stop here and I'm happy to take questions. If no, thank you so much, Marina. It was really interesting to hear about regional frameworks, as well as you said, thinking through the practical support that's needed from multiple stakeholders, also in terms of finance and complementary livelihoods. So I know we have a couple of other partners who wish to share some practical examples. Uh, if you can, please keep it to two minutes so we can manage to then hear the full responses from our UN colleagues uh, and try and connect the dots together before the end of the event. Um, so I'll now pass the floor to Sarah Frocklin from the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation. Sarah, if you're with us. Uh, 
Maybe she's not with us just now. So maybe we'll pass the floor to Flora McCorrin from Blue Ventures uh, for another sharing of practical experience. Hello, thank you. Um, I, I'll be very quick. I wanted to talk about uh, a more nascent project um, which will be launched at the UN Ocean Conference. And we've been supporting um, small scale fishers representatives um, the CFFA, the LMMA network, Coupe Solidar in Costa Rica. Um, and on the uh, 28th, on Tuesday at 8 to 10 in the Tejo restaurant, they'll be launching their um, call to action from artisanal fishing communities. Um, this is a, a parallel um, document declaration to the outcome document for the UN Ocean Conference, and it, they are, we're hoping that this declaration will serve as a basis to explore strategies for addressing the small scale fisheries priorities for change. Um, and it will be used at the conference and then um, taken back to the countries and people can work with it as a as a advocacy document. Um, and it's been really interesting to hear all these um, conversations today and um, I've seen the first draft of the declaration and it looks like um, most of the um, most of the points brought up today are obviously um, parallel all over the world because these are some of the things that I've heard coming out of the other small scale fishes. But it's been really interesting to hear that and I hope anyone who's in um, Lisbon will come along on the 28th. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think it's incredible what Blue Ventures is doing in terms of having SSF voices heard and, you know, distinctly represented at the conference. So we're all going to support your work and also make sure we share it through our networks. Um, so with that, maybe I'll check if uh, Anna Carolina Marciano from Sweet Bio may also wish to share some of the practical activities they're undertaking uh, on human rights of small scale fishers. Thank you. Um, I, I would just like um, more like leave uh, a few questions like for reflection. I think one reflection from our side is that uh, small scale fishers communities are key uh, stewards of freshwater, coastal and uh, marine biodiversity. So it's very important to recognize that. So it's essential to recognize uh, their intertwined uh, relationship with the environment. Also, as mentioned before, uh, these communities have been exposed to several threats like related to the blue economy agenda so that it's really hindering uh, SSF communities from really fully real, uh, having their realization of their human and collective rights. So um, what I've been thinking here is also like SSF leaders are environmental human rights defenders. They are uh, ocean and freshwater defenders. So like they are all, they are working and striving to protect and promote human rights related to the environment. So it's important to emphasize their role and discuss all the violations against this uh, environmental human rights defenders, this small scale fishers. So I think as a, a great community here with different actors, I think it's key to discuss all this violation at, which is increasing um, around the world. And my last point, I think it's also related to our work as well, is to reflect on how crucial it is to policy process and frameworks to integrate a human rights based approach. And as a different community here of different actors like funders, researchers, uh, UN agents, uh, employees, how important it is to support small scale fishers perspective and knowledge and full and meaningful participation in policy process like nationally, regionally and international. So I think a, a bit of the role, it's more um, to support uh, the small scale fishers engagement in all different levels. I think it's my reflection for today. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Anna Carolina. Actually, that gives me an opportunity to share that the colleagues at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights are actually actively working on raising the profile of small scale fishers as environmental human rights defenders, both including references to the role and generally ocean defenders in guidance to UN re uh, resident representatives at the country level, and that should support mobilization of all series of resources by the UN and hopefully others, you know, including bilateral donors to support their work. 
but equally I very much agree with you. And I think the UN Ocean Conference, but maybe also the climate change um, meeting and others are crucial points to raise the responsibility of funders, be that climate funders, ocean research funders, to support small scale fishers in their role as stewards and defenders. And through that, also supporting that voice. And, and I think development, co-development of the knowledge base on which to take better decisions. So definitely everything is, I think, falling into place in our discussion. So I'll, uh, I haven't seen any more questions uh, in the Q&A. One was responded in, in writing, but of course, uh, all the colleagues in the panel may feel like adding on. Um, and so colleagues on the call, feel free to ask more questions in the Q&A. But otherwise, in the interest of time, I think it may be helpful now to move to the section on say UN responses and reflections uh, from the UN system. And so first of all, we would like to um, share with you a video message that the High Commissioner for Human Rights prepared. It's her first message as far as we know to World Oceans Week. So it's very exciting. And I think it's really symbolic of that realization that we need more engagement and exchange with human rights experts in the ocean domain so that, so that we can all build our capacities and create tighter alliances um, to better protect the human rights of small scale fishers. So without further ado, Senya, if you can please play the message, uh, I think that's the right time. Thank you to the One Ocean Hub and the Food and Agricultural Organization for organizing this event. I'm pleased to address you today. As we mark UN World Ocean, we are reminded of the immense value that oceans bring to humanity and our collective role in ensuring their sustainable future. Today's focus on protecting the human rights of small scale fishers is one important one. Fish is a key global source of food and nutritional security. It ensures a livelihood for some 59.5 million people and builds the backbone of the socioeconomic well-being of fisher communities worldwide. Three years ago, the UN General Assembly adopted the Declaration on the Rights of Peasants and other people working in rural areas, specifically including small-scale fishers. Yet, despite this positive step, small-scale fishers and their communities often remain invisible. And climate change, discrimination and marginalization all intersect to threaten their basic rights. Insecure land tenure, access to water and marine resources, lack of access to healthcare, education, social protection, and adequate food and nutrition, abusive and exploitative working conditions. These are just some of their daily realities. Women fishers in particular bear the brunt of discrimination and marginalization. They comprise half of the global fisheries workforce, yet have less access to resources and services. They are more likely to be excluded from leadership and decision-making positions. Their tasks are often unrecognized and underpaid. They are disproportionately affected by gender-based violence. Their legal rights are threatened in cases of divorce, death, or remarriage of their spouse. And these rights violations extend to impact not only women themselves, but also the well-being and survival of their families and children. Colleagues, climate change, including increased floods and droughts, irregular rainfall and extreme weather events, poses enormous risks for small-scale fishers. The warming of the oceans and movement of fish stocks has the potential to disrupt economies, displace communities, bring about conflicts, and amplify threats for the regions of the world who rely upon fishing as a vital sector of their economy. In the Pacific, for example, my office documents how fisher folk rights, including the right to work, has been affected by rising sea levels, extreme weather, overfishing from vessels outside the region, and non-sustainable tourist and development projects. In Africa's Sahel, in the St. Louis region of Senegal, my colleagues have reported that fishermen increasingly have no choice but to seasonally migrate to Mauritania, where fish stocks are less depleted and where there are more work opportunities. Colleagues and friends, international human rights law provides a solid framework to protect the human rights of small-scale fishers. Today, I urge countries to actively implement the Declaration on the Rights of Peasants and other people working in rural areas. We have a unique opportunity to rebalance power relations in the fishing industry by promoting the rights of small-scale fishers 
and by addressing the discrimination and disadvantage they face. And in implementing the declaration, states and other actors should prioritize those who have been historically been marginalized, including older people, youth, children, racial and ethnic minorities, people with disabilities and women, and take appropriate measures to address their problems. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is also a key tool to advance the human rights of small-scale fishers. The upcoming high-level political forum, which will focus on sustainable development, Goal 14, among others, as well as the UN Ocean Conference and the negotiations of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, all offer important opportunities to advance measures and policies that will protect life below water and ensure sustainable use for the benefit of present and future generations. States have a responsibility to reach those who have been left furthest behind and make them protagonists of the most important goals of our generation. To achieve the goals of zero hunger, fighting climate change and protecting biodiversity, the full and meaningful participation of small-scale fishers must be guaranteed. Small-scale fishers have the right to participate in all decision-making processes that may affect their lives, lands, and livelihoods. A strong and independent organization of small-scale fishers should be respected and supported by states and will be crucial in the achievement of these goals. I thank you for your attention. This is really important contribution and I think it reflects some of the points already made and it can allow us all to think about what else maybe we can expect the Office of the High Commissioner and others to, um, to do uh, in, the, in the way forward. Um, I wonder, David, if this is a good time for you to offer your reflection. We've heard quite a lot, many things I'm sure you've heard before, uh, but it'd be really interesting to hear from your side where you see your own work and perhaps that of uh, also human rights experts working with you uh, to help on these issues. Sure, thank you very much, Elisa. And let me just begin by thanking the One Ocean Hub and the FAO for this terrific event uh, this afternoon. I've been following it from two trains and a taxi across Sweden and Denmark, so I'm glad to have finally arrived at my hotel. But there's been so much wisdom uh, expressed over the course of the last hour and a half, it's hard to really even begin to digest it. But I was really struck by some of the fascinating and, and frankly disturbing uh, experiences of fishers and fish workers from South Africa, from India, stories told about Ghana and other places. And some of these, uh, some of these stories and experiences really resonate with uh, stories I've heard from people on country missions that I've done. So, you know, Melissa talked about the lack of consultation of small scale fishers and fish workers in fisheries management decisions. That is a problem I've heard about in Fiji, in Norway, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, it's a, it's a constant failure of states. And I think it's something that we really need to challenge. Jones talked about the way that customary rights are not being recognized by states. And that again is a, a common problem. And Sebastian, similarly, Sebastian talked about collective and community rights often being ignored. And so these problems, I think, come back to a, a basic problem that, that actually Bola talked about, which is that there's still not sufficient understanding of the really fundamental connections between people's human rights and the rights of small scale fishers and the, and, and from my from my vantage point um, the environmental connections to human rights and in some ways we shouldn't be that surprised because it was only a decade ago that the united nations human rights council really first started taking this connection between human rights and the environment seriously by appointing an independent expert to provide them with uh, some basic understanding of the connections between these issues. And I, I acknowledge, of course, that indigenous peoples, local communities, small scale fishers, uh, you've always known that human rights and the environment are deeply interconnected. But for the global system, this has been a slow learning process. And so I think it's really encouraging to recognize that last October, the UN Human Rights Council for the first time recognized that everyone on this planet has the right to live in a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment as a fundamental human right, which is not found in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or any other global human rights instrument. And so my job as Special Rapporteur has been really articulating what does the right to a healthy environment mean? And I think a number of these elements of the right to a healthy environment are of critical importance for small-scale fishers and fish workers. These include 
a bundle of what I call substantive rights and also a bundle of procedural rights. And on the substantive side, this is the right to breathe clean air, a, a right which is violated in many coastal communities by horrific air pollution from things like oil refineries. The right to a healthy environment also includes safe and sufficient water, healthy and sustainably produced food, a safe and stable climate, healthy ecosystems and biodiversity, and non-toxic environments where people can live, work, study, and play. And so I'm sure all of you can think of ways that your fundamental human right to a healthy environment, as it relates to those six elements, uh, is, is in jeopardy or is being violated. And then the right to a healthy environment also comes with a toolkit of procedural rights or participatory rights, including access to information, including the right to participate in government decision making, and importantly, the right to the right of access to justice and effective remedies when your rights are being violated or threatened. Something that Taryn talked about in an encouraging case from South Africa recently uh, involving small scale fishers and consultation rights in the context of possible offshore oil and gas activities. And interestingly, there was also a similar case in Argentina uh, in, in about the same time period. So it's encouraging to see coastal communities, small scale fishers, indigenous peoples asserting their rights. And I think that goes back to another point that Bola made, which is many of these rights are constitutionally protected, meaning they have the highest and strongest form of legal protection in our societies. And that does open up opportunities for judicial protection. Um, the right to a healthy environment also, in addition to those substantive elements and those procedural aspects, is also guided by some really fundamental universal human rights principles, which include prevention, precaution, non-discrimination, and non-regression. And in the context of small-scale fishers, I've done some work with a colleague who's on the, on the call today, Nathan Bennett, about the, the, the really profound environmental injustices taking place in the context of coastal communities, small-scale fishers, uh, and other peoples uh, related to the oceans. Now, there's been a lot of work done about environmental injustice on land and cities, and far less done in the context of oceans. And so, you know, together we looked at the impacts of climate change, chemical pollution, plastic waste, marine debris, ecosystem degradation, and fisheries over exploitation, all of which collectively have a major impact on the populations of fish and seaweed and the things that are, are so closely connected not just to the right to a healthy environment, but for small scale fishers to the right to an adequate livelihood, to cultural rights, to rights to food, to rights to health. And, and that's where we come. Another connection that we've heard today is the connection between human rights and the sustainable development goals. You know, every government I talk to completely misunderstands the SDGs, thinks that they're just a bunch of aspirational goals and targets for 2030. Every single one of the sustainable development goals has a foundation of human rights. And that means that they are not options for states to pursue. They are obligations. Some of those obligations are subject to a concept called progressive realization, which recognizes that we can't build Rome in a day and to deal with the climate crisis or to eliminate the air pollution that afflicts 90% of people in this world, it's going to take time. But even though states have this uh, obligation of progressive realization, they also have an obligation to dedicate the maximum available resources to achieving and fulfilling these human rights. And I can tell you that there's probably not a single government in the world that's currently fulfilling that obligation. And there are some of these human rights obligations that are of immediate effect. Even so, so for example, non-discrimination is a fundamental uh, obligation of all states in the pursuit of all of these human rights, whether it's the right to food, whether it's the right to health, whether it's the right to an adequate standard of living, or whether it's the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. And again, here we know that there are just cases everywhere where poor, vulnerable and marginalized communities are bearing a disproportionate burden of the impacts of the climate crisis, of air and water pollution, of uh, lack of access to green spaces and of uh, toxic chemicals. And so that's, that's not acceptable and we need to do everything in our power and to address those, those what I believe are, are examples of discrimination that violate states' human rights obligations. 
Uh, and then the other elephant in the room is business. And we've heard several people mention the role of business. We have UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And I'll be the, I won't be the first to say that those guiding principles, which are more than a decade old now, are not up to the challenges of the 21st century. We need legally binding regulations that require businesses to um, do human rights and environmental due diligence, to comply with human rights standards, to comply with environmental standards. And so it's encouraging to see that there are processes ongoing both at the national, regional and global level to try and deliver on those legal, legally binding mechanisms to uh, ensure that we regulate the business, the business sector. So there's a European Union directive in the works. There's a UN treaty on businesses and human rights that are in the works. And I think it's really important to have the voices of small scale fishers in those forums outlining the ways that businesses and corporations are impacting your human rights. Uh, the final thing I'll say is just there are uh, a number of UN mechanisms that have been discussed by various people today. There are the special procedures of which there are now more than 40. Uh, I'm the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment. I think other critically important ones from the vantage point of small scale fishers would be the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, Special Rapporteur on Cultural Rights, the Working Group on Business and Human Rights. And there are various ways that people can work together with us. And um, one of those ways is through the reports that we present to the general, to the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly. My next report is actually going to be on the relationship between the sustainable development goals and the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. I would love to have uh, some reference to the uh, challenges facing small scale fishers in that report. My next report after that to the Human Rights Council will be looking at the interplay between gender and the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. Again, I think there are some really important and relevant uh, elements of the uh, challenges facing small scale fishers. And then after that, I'm going to do a report on the role of businesses in, in fulfilling the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. So again, I think these reports all have relevance to the work that all of you are doing. Then there's the UN treaty bodies, which include the Human Rights Committee, the Committee on the Rights of the Child, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. They do periodic reviews of national government performance in protecting uh, the human rights under their sort of under their jurisdiction. And I think there's a role to engage with there. And then, of course, there's the universal periodic review process. And all of these all of these none of these are perfect mechanisms. They all have strengths and weaknesses, but I think they're all mechanisms that could be usefully engaged with. Um, and so I think that there's tremendous potential for working together. And again, just to just I don't want to take too much time, but I'll just say in closing that I think that these issues that you're facing are really interconnected in, in profound ways with the issues that I'm working on with the sustainable development goals. And so uh, I really look forward to collaboration, cooperation and moving forward in the future to overcome the challenges that we all collectively face. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. That gave us also a lot of ideas that we'll need to digest about how we can best contribute to all these efforts. Um, but thinking about them in internet connected ways is equally important. I think interconnecting fights and finding more systemic um, solutions to these problems is definitely really important. Um, with that, I'll pass on the floor to Cise Jenschno from the um, Food and Agriculture Organization, the legal office. And I think many of the issues, including the very technical ones, some of the technical barriers to recognition on small scale fishers and customary laws um, are really very much in the central areas of work and strength of FAO. So it'll be really great to hear from him how FAO is and may even more um, contribute to the human rights-based approach to small scale fisheries. So Cisse, you have the floor. Thank you, Eliza and colleagues. I hope you can all hear me. Um, yes, I'm and we can hear your to, slides well. Yeah, I'm trying to go through the slides at the same time. Yes, uh, yeah, um, coming after all this uh, rich presentations from the country level as well as from the, the international level, I see that a lot of the issues have been addressed in terms of uh, both the conceptual as well as the practical uh, problems uh, that, that, that we face in terms of uh, human rights uh, within the small scale fisheries uh, sector. 
So just to introduce, uh, start with an introduction of uh, Pao's work in this area. Pao has been working on the human rights approach to food and agriculture from the 1990s. Uh, a number of instruments have been adopted to guide its work, starting from the voluntary guidelines on the right to adequate food from 2014, 2004. Uh, through um, the voluntary guidelines on the responsible governance of tenure, including fisheries, uh, investment in agriculture, all the way to a voluntary guideline on food systems and nutrition from last year. Uh, I think um, if you see all these instruments uh, in focus uh, through the years have been uh, primarily the right to adequate food, uh, but also uh, tenure rights tenor rights, which include customary tenor rights. Uh, I see colleagues have uh, raised these issues a number of times in terms of the non-recognition of customary tenor rights at the national level. But the idea here is that uh, when you recognize tenor rights, central in the recognition of tenor rights is that customary rights are recognized. So if that is not done, of course, as one of the colleagues said, uh, I think it's Jones, uh, the recognition of customary rights would be a bit empty. Um, so um, after these instruments, uh, you'll find the voluntary guidelines on small scale fisheries, uh, which in my view introduced a paradigm shift in terms of the international level normative recognition of human rights in the context of fisheries. At, at least in my view in three ways. Uh, one is it clearly articulates the fact that fisheries are not, uh, that the sector shouldn't just uh, concern itself in conservation of resources. Uh, fisheries are not just about the resources, but uh, also about uh, the livelihoods that are attached to them. Uh, that uh, a people-centered -center, approach should lead the way in terms of both policy and practice. It goes further also in terms of uh, widening the envelope of human rights, the substantive rights that are covered in the context of uh, you know, fisheries in, in general, going beyond right to food in the context of FAO and uh, governance of tenor or tenor rights recognition to include more specific rights on decent work. For example, labor issues have uh, found themselves into uh, the realm of the work of the organization, specifically in terms of uh, in, in the fishery sector. Third, uh, thirdly, and more importantly, in addition to expressly integrating the internationally recognized human rights instruments, uh, in particular those relating to um, the vulnerability and marginalization of people who draw their livelihoods from the sector, uh, putting a lot of emphasis, of course, on uh, indigenous people's rights. I see a number of colleagues have talked about consultation in terms of the procedural rights. We need to always keep in mind that when it comes to indigenous people's rights, we deal with consent, the ethnic principles, uh, the free, prior, and informed consent, uh, not just consultation. All those have been emphasized in this instrument to the extent that it says the objectives of the voluntary guidelines are to be fulfilled through a human rights based approach to development. Basically, it talks about the approach uh, to be one based on human rights. So in its sense, if you look at this instrument, which is from 2014, it is a human rights instrument focusing on small scale fisheries in a way. Now, in terms of rolling this instrument out, um, in, in practice, uh, there has been a lot of work that has gone into unpacking what human rights-based approach means from the three lenses, right? You start with uh, the substantive rights that you all talked about uh, all the way through from uh, recognition of tenor rights, um, right to adequate food, all the way to labor rights, uh, decent work-related rights but also the uh, process principles, the procedural rights, which in FAO we call PANTER for short. It's an acronym that stands for participation, accountability, non-discrimination, transparency, human dignity, empowerment, and rule of law. But also the whole idea of um, empowering, um, uh, the, developing the capacity of duty bearers, not only states, but also uh, private actors, uh, but also, 
developing the capacity of right holders, basically small scale fisheries, communities, fishers and fishery, fish, fish, fish workers to claim their rights uh, through this approach. Now, I think when we move to the practical level in terms of implementing these instruments, uh, if I go back to 2016, where uh, in FAO we launched a huge exercise, uh, Nicole is here, um, I, I was uh, part of that team organizing an international conference on human rights and small scale fisheries. Of course, the biggest audience uh, that came to that conference was uh, fisheries communities, small, especially small scale fisheries, uh, people working on uh, with small scale fisheries. Uh, we see, at least in my view, there was a lot of awareness, a lot of interest uh, in, in the human rights aspect of it, because the whole idea of the sector relating to traditional practices, uh, marginalization, vulnerability, the whole human rights concept resonated very well. Uh, but uh, uh, we also recognized in that context that there is a need to build a lot of capacity within the sector players, within the sector itself. I think over the years, FAO has uh, developed a number of instruments, uh, a legislative guide on small scale fisheries, diagnostic tools, which help states to identify where the gaps are, but also reaching out to stakeholders in terms of capacity building exercises and uh, providing information database within uh, the FAOLEX, which is a legislative database, a huge legislative database of FAO, which contains a number of normative instruments from the national to the international level as well. But also national level activities uh, in Malawi, in Tanzania, uh, with a view to support national plans of actions. I think one of the issues that came out very clearly from a number of presentations is that there is a gap in national level legal frameworks, but also strategy and plan of action for the sector. And I think there seems to be a move towards that. I saw that from uh, Tapiwe's uh, presentation in Namibia, the work of FAO in Tanzania and uh, other places uh, where a lot of work is going on in that area. So I think if I kind of uh, take a hindsight on where a huge uh, amount of work started in this area, let's say 2015, 16, uh, I, I would say that the light has been turned on uh, on human rights and their relevance uh, for the small scale fisheries sector and the other way around. But uh, from the presentations that have come out so far, I think it's clear that there is a, a still a bit of disconnect between the two sectors. I remember um, going to uh, Indonesia to support a human rights leg legislation for the fisheries sector. I went there on behalf of FAO in 2015. Uh, one of the first things that I, I observed was that the fisheries uh, uh, ministry was working on this issue, which included human rights and labor issues without really engaging with the ministries or the state and institutions in charge of human rights and, and labor. There is a bit of a divide now. In, in practice as well, from Indonesia all the way to Uganda, in the context of this type of work, especially in labor in fisheries, we have seen that uh, the human rights institutions, the labor institutions are pretty much absent from the fisheries sector and the other way around, the fisheries sector uh, basically engaged itself primarily with resource resource conservation, sustainability, and related issues. But I see that uh, a lot of uh, road has been traveled in terms of bringing together the two sectors. At the international level, uh, we had a number of people commenting that uh, fisheries is in Rome, human rights and labor are in Geneva. There is a bit of a disconnect. The ministers coming to the FAO conferences are fisheries related uh, uh, ministers from the states as well, whereas human rights related mandates, labor related mandates go to Geneva. I think with a lot of exercise with uh, the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights, with ILO, there is increasing uh, interest in bring, bringing the, the issues to bear. In, in the sectors. I think with uh, the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture, uh, with the COVID Declaration on Sustainable Fisheries, 
uh, with the UN General Assembly uh, resolution in 2021 on sustainable fisheries, uh, all the way to um, the SDGs, which have been raised by a number of you. Uh, FAO is, by the way, custodian for two of the indicators, at least, on access to the resources and market, as well as policies and uh, laws, uh, uh, the necessity of putting such uh, normative frameworks in place, all the way to the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous uh, Issues. I think uh, the work which is being done by the Danish Institute for Human Rights, I had the pleasure of joining you in a conference in Nairobi for national human rights institutions a couple of years ago. That's a really worthwhile initiative which brings uh, human rights and fisheries, uh, small scale fisheries in particular, uh, to kind of address each other's uh, challenges and problems at the national level, where in fact the tire hits the road, where in fact problems can be easily solved. So I think the way forward is uh, to me a bright one in terms of bringing the sectors together. But of course the challenges remain, it's a daily struggle and we are all in, in this together. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate uh, that uh, uh, this conference is being organized in the context of the One Ocean Hub, Hub as well. Thank you Elisa and team for inviting me to this conference. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Cesar. And it's very clear from your pre presentation that there's so much the FAO is doing, but can also do much more that we can do, as you say, to further bring together, I think, the fisheries and, and human rights um, experts and communities and advocates there. So we, we have 10 minutes left, and I have a few maybe points to summarize. But before I do that, I'm just wondering if either uh, Melissa, John Thomas, or, or Sebastian wish to say anything to respond or, or let us know if what, what we discussed was helpful compared to what they said. So I see, um, Jones, you have your hand up. Would you like to um, share a few concluding thoughts? Yeah. So uh, to summarize is that uh, the problem here is that uh, problem within uh, of the ocean people is that uh, thinking ocean as the property rights, the conceptualization and the research on most of us see from a, a property rights views. So that is totally a different view because we never said that the ocean belongs to us. We said that we, we belong to the ocean. It's a different narrative. And uh, th that's what how we, how this property rights gets contradictions with contradictions with the other laws or the positional laws that has been brought. Because when you say property rights, state says that this is my property, which which uh, which erase our identity over the ocean resources and our ocean spaces. The second is that seeing fisheries as a resource. When you say resource itself, only we all talk, discuss about the production, the regulation, the management, the business out of it. To get the resource more, to get the more money. But we see only the life below the water, not the life above the water. So there the problem comes because fisher people, customary rights has been denied in that perspective. Third thing is that seeing fishing has an occupation for the traditional fishers or the ocean tribes. So that is totally a different narration because fishing is an identity and the ocean is an identity. So this is how the human rights has been. This is a major challenge. We have to locate. And when, when you locate within the human rights instruments itself, it is a little tricky because human rights largely argue for individual rights, not collective rights, only few like SIDRIP and others collective rights. So how to locate our customary rights into the human rights instruments. So that is the other, other way around. We have to see what, because th that's what we are, we are, we are including me, we are all trying to put, uh, uh, to, uh, see the small, small size shirt to be put for a, uh, put to a person, but the person needs a extra large t-shirt to wear. So this is how we are been uh, contradicting with the laws and that. So, we belong to the we belong to the ocean, not the ocean belongs to us. Thank you. Thank you. Now, as you say, we, we have to turn around how people in power and elsewhere see these things in the first place. I think that's a crucial point. Um, so Sebastian next and then Melissa. Thank you so much. So Sebastian. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, raise uh, a question. Uh, in fact, I put it in the chat as well. Uh, because there was no reference uh, made to the UN Convention on Law of the Sea. Uh, because uh, if you look at it, uh, the human rights issues are more treated under the flag state obligation. 
So, but I strongly feel that uh, the coastal state obligations are very important when it comes to small scale fisheries. So therefore, is it possible to uh, bring uh, uh, this issue to the attention of uh, you know, the UN and to look at you know, what are the obligations that we can think of for the coastal state in relation to human rights, so small scale fishers uh, and customary rights and all those issues. And I think in addition to that, maybe uh, the, the baseline uh, concept, which is embedded in the law of the sea convention, normal baseline, straight baseline, archipelagic baseline. I think all these terms have to come into because this is, these are often not well understood by uh, most people I, we talk to in fisheries. So I think these are very important concepts to bring in. And even one can argue that most of the uh, marine space within the baseline, absolute sovereignty should be earmarked as a protected space for small scale fishers. So in, in addition to marine protected area, we can have a marine livelihood area for small scale fishers in, in, in areas within the uh, in general uh, waters in the, within the uh, baseline. So I think these are again uh, uh, ideas which we need to develop further. So therefore the conventional law of the sea framework is very important when we engage with uh, all these issues. A marine environment, small scale fisheries, conflict with small and large scale, fleet migration, distant water fishing, coastal fisheries, so on and so forth. Well, thank you so much. It's a crucial point. And in fact, under the One Ocean Hub, we're doing quite a bit of work as researchers to really connect the due diligence and other obligations of states under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea with human rights and protection of biodiversity and other. And I think we can do much more work with the partners on this call, also explore with FAO where we can bring that those research insights and you know FAO's own work in these areas and potentially with David and other um, UN human rights colleagues and see how we can feed that because it is a, a you know the law of the seas are it's distinct uh, areas of expertise and it's, it's not so obvious to make those connections so that's a, a crucial area of clarity for then making progress in an interconnected way so thank you so much for raising that uh, Melissa please let us know what you think of what we've discussed so far Okay, Lisa. Um, I just I'm not gonna say a lot. Um, I just want what's been speaking, and we were very blind on what our human rights stand for, and um, we've learned we've learned a lot, and now we can take back from that and what everyone has said, and I just want to thank Theron for including us in this webinar, and I hope in the future we can get more involved in our human rights. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, everyone. Well, thank you so much, Melissa. That's really important for us to hear. And uh, I know Tarin had to leave, but I wanted to mention how important it is that we remain connected as, as it fits with people's priorities, including yourselves, and in taking this forward and working at different um, levels to make progress. And so I want to mention that Yourselves and other small scale fishers cooperatives are involved in the coastal justice network in South Africa, the many hub researchers and others and NGOs have brought together. And I think that that certainly we want to reflect with all the colleagues in the coastal justice what we can take from this event and how we can support and maybe explore more collaboration potentially with David and FAO and others. Um, UN bodies that can support, I think, the important um, work that you are doing on the ground, but equally share all the learning from your work with the other countries. And I think that's a, a benefit of the One Ocean Hub that our colleagues in Ghana and Namibia actually are really keen to hear about how the Coastal Justice Network is making a difference, what's needed to support it moving forward, and, and they can really learn from your efforts too. Um, at the same time, I think there is work that can be done internationally and then be used uh, in national courts and in national debates. Um, I think that all the questions that we raised today around the indivisibility of the human rights of small scale fishers, the multiple contributions they make to the protection of the environment, to the benefit of everyone's right to a healthy environment, and the fact that the, you, know, you have the best uh, experience and understanding of those interconnections of the marine environment with life uh, underwater and above water and different dimensions of, of human well-being. All of that are things that we need to do a better job to capture internationally at the regional level and find responses from those levels that complement the work that you are doing um, at the national level. 
Um, and I think one thing I will try to do with colleagues in the follow up to this event is really think about how much we have clarified about who can do what and who should do what. Um, because we, we really have to challenge the understanding that maybe some public authorities and others have a technical role to play, but not necessarily a human rights role to play, whereas we have to clarify as much as possible that human rights is everybody's business and everybody's responsibility, and we can all make uh, an important contribution. But I think being able to detail what each of us needs to do, be that, as we were saying, flag states, as opposed to coastal states, as opposed to UN monitoring bodies, as opposed to researchers and funders, that's, I think, the work that we can do to make change happen at different levels. And so just to say, as part of that work that we will do after this event, there'll be capturing of messages that will either take forward uh, through uh, the Ocean Hub research and our partnerships, uh, but also we want to engage with all the partners on the call um, in terms of capturing key messages and thinking about who we need to tell about the insights that we identified today throughout this year and beyond. And as you've heard, many colleagues uh, in different civil society organizations uh, and also national human rights bodies um, are already working towards um, paying more attention to small scale fishes rights at the UN Ocean Conference. So that's definitely our next steps in bringing forward the messages and getting a better sense of who else needs to do work here and how we can connect our work there. Um, but there are other opportunities, the studies that the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues has commissioned to FAO to take on board, um, the work that we can do uh, at other meetings, at the Human Rights Council meetings, those reports that David will be working on in the next couple of years. What we'll try to do with these partnerships um, from you know, World Oceans Week onwards on small scale fishers rights is really making sure that those of us who can, can be very um, as detailed as possible in passing on the message to different audiences in the terms that speak to those audiences so that then we'll have hopefully a, a domino effect and more and more people will be more um, equipped and more understanding and more connected to contribute uh, to that coherent protection of the human rights of small scale fishers and connecting resources uh, and opportunities to strengthen efforts on the ground from different sources. Um, so with that, I think I will bring this to a close and just say that we will stay in touch in different ways with all of you. Uh, and I'm really, really um, grateful, I think, for, for all of you to spend in the time today and sharing so much of your understanding. Um, you have our contacts to so do, get in touch if you have other ideas that we were not able to address today, because um, I think there will be so many ways in which we will continue to make progress on the many points and insights that were identified today. So thank you all so very much. Um, please stay in touch in the ways that are best fit for you. Thank you so much, David, for being there and CSA. And we will also report to our colleagues at the High Commissioner for Human Rights what we learned and, and what we can send back to them for their contribution. Thank you all and see you very soon. Thanks, Elisa. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, David. Bye. Thanks, thank you, everyone. Bye.